A different type of boundary conditions that comes up from time to time is periodic boundary conditions. <clears throat> so for the interval from minus pi to pi, periodic boundary conditions would be setting the value of y to be equal uh, at both ends of the interval and the value of its derivative to be equal at both ends of the interval. So a function with periodic boundary conditions is essentially a continuously differentiable function on the circle. And so what, what I mean by that is that if we look at um, a periodic function, so here's some periodic function, um, <clears throat> and I've got one, uh, one, one period shaded there. And then if the function is uh, set to have the same value at, at the um, start and end point of, uh, of its, its domain, and also the same derivative so that the angle uh, going out one direction matches the angle coming in the other direction or vice versa, um, then it's just the same thing mathematically as, as looking at um, a function which is defined uh, to have the circle as its uh, domain. So, uh, there we go. Maybe that looks slightly better. OK. Um, <clears throat> so anyway, so this, this is the, the same function visualized uh, over the interval or um, with domain equal to the, um, the circle. Anyway. Oh, and if you're wondering why the circle is denoted with a T, that's for torus, because it's a one-dimensional torus. OK. So uh, a regular. Um, sturm liouville problem, like we saw before, has separated boundary conditions. And so in other words, there's the boundary condition at A, and there's the boundary condition at B, and the values of Y or Y prime between A and B are not related. So that's very different from what we've got in this periodic case. So for periodic boundary conditions, this is not considered a, a regular sturm liouville problem. So let's look at um, an example. We'll look at good old Y prime plus lambda Y equals 0 um, on the uh, interval from minus pi uh, to pi with um, periodic uh, oops, boundary conditions. OK, so let's see. Suppose we look for um, negative eigenvalues. So in this case, we know that the general form for y looks like a cosh x root minus lambda plus b cinch x root minus uh, lambda. So if we evaluate um, y at both endpoints of the interval, then we will have this equation right here where um, on the left side, we will evaluate it at um, minus pi. And on the right side, we will evaluate it um, at pi. OK, and so what happens here is cosh is an even function, so we can get rid of this minus sign. And cinch is. Um, uh, odd, so we can get rid of this at the cost of putting it out front. And then the equation tells us that, uh, well, a cosh equals a cosh, fine, yeah, whatever. But then we also have um, b cinch equals um, minus b cinch. And so uh, cinch is equal to 0 if and only if or only at, at the point 0 itself. And since uh, lambda is strictly negative and pi is positive, uh, that would force um, b to be equal to 0. And similarly, if we look at the equation for um, uh, y prime, um, That'll force a to be equal to 0. 
Okay, so moral of the story, um, if lambda is negative, y is trivial, so we don't get any negative eigenvalues or, or eigenvectors for them. All right, what about if uh, we take lambda to be 0? So in this case, uh, the general form for the solution is a plus bx, uh, linear polynomial. Um, <clears throat> and then if we evaluate this at um, minus pi, and that's equal to when it's evaluated at pi, um, then again, this tells us that uh, b is equal to 0. Um, and so then y has to be equal to um, the function a. And does that work? Let's see. So if y is equal to a, then we evaluate it at either endpoint, or sorry, we look at its derivative, y prime, and that's 0. And we evaluate that at either endpoint, and we get 0, and 0 is equal to 0. So OK, looks like we got a winner. So lambda equals 0 will give us an eigenvalue. And we have corresponding eigenvector, uh, a constant function. And what about uh, if lambda is positive? So if lambda is positive, then our general form for the solution looks like a cosine x root lambda plus b sine x root lambda. Um, and so if we evaluate this one at um, minus pi and pi, let's see. So these are supposed to be equal, and we're evaluating the first one now at uh, minus pi. And we'll evaluate the second one at pi. Then let's see. Well, same argument as for um, uh, cosh and cinch before. Uh, this one, uh, the cosine is even, so we can take the minus sign out, and sine is even, so we can take the minus sign out and put it here. Sorry, sine is odd, so we can take the minus sign out and put it there. Um, and then what do we have? So uh, now um, a cosine equals a cosine. OK, fine, whatever. And then we have um, the other uh, adding the minus b to the other side. We have 2b sine pi uh, root lambda equals 0. So that doesn't necessarily force b to be equal to 0. It could be the case that um, sine pi root lambda is equal to 0. And that would happen precisely when pi root lambda, uh, or actually, let me just make it simpler, uh, when root lambda is an integer. And so we end up with uh, eigenvalues lambda n equal to n squared. Um, and this is, uh, and then we have corresponding, oh, and this is for um, n equal to <coughs> 1, 2, 3, and so on. But then if you look back at the lambda equals 0 case, uh, that also works for 0. So we could just say 0, 1, 2, and so forth, and take all of the um, non-negative eigenvalues into account the same way. Now, what is the corresponding eigenvector? Uh, well, we had no constraints on, oh, I skipped a step, my bad. Uh, we're still going to have this happen, but let's just wait a moment. I forgot to look at what happens when we um, check out the derivative. So the derivative uh, y prime, so this is going to be minus a root lambda sine x root lambda plus b root lambda cosine x root lambda. And so the um, uh, same e equation here, so evaluating and setting y prime of minus pi equal to y prime of pi, um, this leads to exactly the same thing. Um, oh, I guess, strictly speaking, 
this time we've got a root lambda there. Um, oh, oh, and actually that's a this time around. OK. Um, <coughs> but it's the same conclusion. And that is that, that we have root lambda equal to uh, an, a positive integer. So that leads us to uh, this, this situation that we have right here. And if we look at the corresponding eigenvector, um, well, this worked for our uh, uh, entire function. So for yn, uh, we can take a n uh, cosine x n and sine x n. Um, and so we actually get um, that the dimension of the eigenspace for lambda equals n squared is 2. Uh, this does not contradict the sturm liouville theorem, however, because this was not a regular sturm liouville problem. Um, but anyway, so this is where we get the uh, regular standard Fourier series. It comes from the periodic case, which makes sense with what we've seen before.